Good afternoon, everyone. I think it's time to get started. My name is Stan Floresco, and it is my great privilege and honor to be your chair today for today's symposium, That's Why They Call It Gambling Full Colon, Neural Mechanisms Regulating Risk-Reward Decision-Making. Now, our understanding of the neural basis of decision-making really finds its origins in the pioneering work of Antonio Damasio and Antoine Bechera, who in the mid-90s developed this revolutionary task we now refer to as the Iowa Gambling Task. And over the last 20 years, studies using fMRI, different patient populations, and uh, different types of assays have really helped us understand the neural mechanisms and the different neural circuits that underlie certain aspects of cost-benefit decision-making. <clears throat> now, in the last 10 years or so, there have been considerable advancements in modeling these processes in laboratory animals. And these studies, of course, are very useful for understanding the pharmacological, neural circuits, and neurophysiological underpinnings of different aspects of decision-making in both normal and abnormal situations. So we've got a really great show lined up for you tonight. We have a bunch of high-powered, dynamic speakers presenting to you some world-class, cutting-edge research on this topic. And some of them are even good-looking. Yeah, we'll have a text poll after. Text one if you think so-and-so isn't. No, I'm already in trouble. So we'll start this with a talk by yours truly called, What's Better For Me? Full colon, Neural Circuits Mediating Subjective Decision Biases. Now, life routinely presents us with situations where we have to choose between different options that may yield us different types of rewards. And these options can vary in terms of their subjective value. Choosing between two things we like, we just happen to like one more than the other, Godiva's versus Hershey's chocolate, or their objective value, basically more versus less reward. And all things being equal, we tend to like larger versus smaller rewards. But the decisions that we wrestle with that give us pause are when these larger or better rewards are associated with some sort of cost that can diminish the subjective value of objectively large rewards. Sometimes we may have to work a little harder or wait a little longer to obtain these better rewards, or as will be the focus of this panel, sometimes these larger rewards will be associated with some sort of risk or uncertainty. And these are particularly tricky types of situations because here you have to do the long-term cost-benefit math and try to figure out, well, I may not always get rewarded for a certain course of action, but will it be better for me in the long term for me to play a little more risky or a little more conservative? Now, as I alluded to before, we know from studies with humans that certain aspects of risk-reward decision-making is mediated by distributed neural circuits linking different regions of the frontal lobes, the amygdala, and the ventral striatum. One thing all those regions have in common, of course, is they're all interconnected with the mesocortical limbic dopamine system. We, of course, know that dopamine has something to do with reward, but we can't always agree what that is. We know that dopamine neurons will fire in phasic bursts in response to an unexpected reward or a cue that predicts an upcoming reward, and they will suppress their activity, show a phasic dip when an expected reward is omitted. But we also know these neurons are particularly ticklish to situations that present reward uncertainty. And these are just some seminal data from Wolfram Schultz's group showing that stimuli that are associated with a maximum amount of reward uncertainty can evoke the maximal increase in dopamine neuron firing. So this dopamine system seems to be particularly geared to turn on when it's not sure or not whether it's going to get rewarded. So to better understand how different nodes within the mesocortical limbic dopamine system may regulate certain aspects of risk-reward decision-making, work in our laboratory has opted to use a probabilistic discounting task conducted in an operant chamber. This is a little bit different than some of the other assays that were described earlier, and this one focuses primarily on just getting a reward or not. And the way this game works is on any given free choice trial, we present the rat with two options. If it chooses the small certain option, it always gets this smaller one pellet reward. So this is a safe Canadian government bond savings option, okay? It's not gonna pay a lot, but it's always gonna give you a return on the investment. If on the other hand, the rat chooses the large risky option, it may or may not get this larger four pellet reward. Now the odds of receiving that reward changes in a systematic manner within a session over blocks of trials. Sometimes the odds are very good at the start of the session, starting at 100% and then progressively get leaner, and other times the odds start poor at 12.5% and get better. And changes in the reward probabilities are signaled by blocks of forced choice trials, where we present the animal only with one lever and let it sample it, so it understands this is roughly how much that risky option is paying off at this point in time. Now, when we train animals for about 20 to 25 days in this task, you'll see this nice stable discounting curve. What this is representing is how often they choose that risky option based on the probability of obtaining that larger reward. And you can see they choose it more often when the odds are good, and they choose it less often when the odds are poor. Now, in some of our initial studies, we showed that if we increase dopamine transmission with drugs like amphetamine, 
We get a market increase in risky choice under these conditions. Whereas if we reduce dopamine transmission with a systemic injection of an antagonist, we see the opposite effect. Animals become more risk averse, don't like to play as risky and choose a safe option more often. So knowing that somewhere in the brain dopamine is acting to modify these biases, over the last six years, we have systematically picked at different nodes of the mesocortical limbic dopamine system. Some of those regions are shown here using reversible inactivations. And so the way these experiments work is we train the animals up till they're very good at the task and they kind of know the basic game. And then on the test day, we temporarily inactivate a region with infusions of GABA agonists or what have you. And to see when we take that node out of the circuit, how does that change the way the animal plays the game? And all these studies are within subjects design. So what I'm gonna do here is summarize six years of work in 90 seconds, so please strap in. One circuit linking the basolateral amygdala to the nucleus accumbens shell seems to play a key role in biasing choice towards larger uncertain rewards. Because we found if we inactivate either structure by itself or disconnect communication between the two of them, animals become more risk averse. They start choosing that risky option less. So this circuit in the brain lights up when you're playing Texas Hold'em and you have a pair of kings in your hands and it's saying, go all in, throw all that money, go after that big reward. But this more subcortical visceral urge is tempered by different regions of the frontal lobe. Specifically, we found that the medial region of the orbital frontal cortex seems to put a break on chasing after these larger risky rewards. Because when we inactivate it, animals uniformly become more risky. Keep chasing after these larger rewards even when it not, may not be as advantageous to do so. Now another region of the prefrontal cortex, the prelimbic region of the medial PFC, this seems to be playing a more cognitive role in regulating uh, these processes. Our studies suggest that this is kind of keeping track of actions and outcomes over time and kind of monitoring changes in reward probabilities, kind of getting a general gist, hey, how are things now compared to they were 10 minutes ago? And helping the animal adjust its behavior when reward probabilities change. So when the odds start good and then eventually get poor, inactivation of prefrontal cortex makes animals a little more inflexible and they keep choosing more risky. And we know the prefrontal cortex helps modify decision bias through an interaction with the basolateral amygdala. Because if we disconnect this circuit with an asymmetrical procedure, we see similar phenotype to prefrontal inactivations. Animals play more risky. Now, one thing I wanna kinda highlight here is what's the directionality in this circuit? As you may know, amygdala and prefrontal cortex are reciprocally connected. So when we disconnect this pathway, we don't know what exactly is going on. Is it a problem that the amygdala can't send information to prefrontal cortex? Prefrontal cortex can't send information to amygdala or what have you. Turns out though, nature has provided us a way to kind of exploit these pathways and selectively knock out one-way communication in this circuit. Because in a collaborative study we did with Scott Zam, we mapped out the axonal pathways from amygdala to prefrontal and prefrontal to amygdala. Turns out they take different routes in the brain. So just to show you a stylized diagram here, what we found was that ascending projections from the amygdala course along the ventrolateral edge and terminate in the prefrontal cortex. Whereas top-down projections from prefrontal cortex to the amygdala start in prefrontal cortex, go through medial stratum and converge in internal capsule before terminating in the amygdala. So to selectively disrupt one-way communication in these pathways, what we did was we used a unilateral activation of the ascending axons from the amygdala with a contralateral inactivation of the prefrontal cortex, or a unilateral inactivation of the descending axons in the internal capsule with a contralateral inactivation of the amygdala. So just to cut to the chase, what we found was when we disrupted bottom-up communication, so amygdala signals to prefrontal cortex, we saw no change in behavior. So it didn't see, this pathway didn't seem to be critical for helping the animal adjust its behavior. On the other hand, when we disrupted prefrontal top-down control of the amygdala, that's where we saw the same basic effect as before. Animals were slower to update their behavior, and under these conditions, they were more risky. And the reason they were more risky is that they were less sensitive to losses. Normally, when a rat plays this game, plays risky and loses, it switches to the conservative option on 40% of the trials. But when we disconnected communication between prefrontal and amygdala, that dropped dramatically as if they didn't seem to either care or weren't aware that they were losing as much, and so they kept playing risky as if they were winning more than they actually were. <clears throat> so what this suggests is that prefrontal cortex exerts this top-down control over the amygdala, keeping track of the long view. How are things going? How have our rates of return been going? And may kind of damp down that urge of the amygdala to chase after those larger big rewards. Now, knowing some of the nodes and their contribution to the circuit, we then wanted to see, well, what's dopamine doing in these different terminal regions? 
So we used some basic behavioral pharmacology. And what we found was when we blocked dopamine D2 receptors in the prefrontal cortex, we saw an effect very similar to inactivation of this region. Animals were considerably more risky and they were more inflexible, which suggests to us that D2 receptors in prefrontal cortex may promote exploration of new options when reward probabilities are changing and they're not as good as they used to be. Interestingly, when we blocked D1 receptors in prefrontal cortex, we saw the diametrically opposite effect. Animals were actually risk averse. And in this case, they were more sensitive to losses. If they played risky and lost, they were more likely to jump and choose the safe option or the certain option on the next trial. And so what this suggests to us is D1 receptors are playing a different role in prefrontal cortex than D2 receptors and may promote exploitation of currently favorable situations, helping an animal keep its eye on the prize. Yeah, just because you lost on this trial, that's okay. Let's keep persisting this pattern of behavior because it might be more profitable in the long term. And furthermore, what this suggests is that dopamine may be mediating different and sometimes opposing patterns of behavior via separate populations of prefrontal neurons that express only D1 or only D2 receptors. In the accumbens, the story was a little more straightforward. First thing I'll tell you is that D2 receptor manipulation had no effect. Blockade or stimulation of these receptors didn't affect choice behavior. They were slower to make choices, they showed less locomotion, so they were behaviorally active, but it didn't affect the way they played the game. Whereas when we blocked D1 receptors in the accumbens, again, animals were risk averse, like we saw in the PFC, and they were more sensitive to losses. Interestingly, when we stimulated D1 receptors, we actually made rats better players. We optimized their decision making. What I mean by that is they actually chose the risky option more when it was more advantageous to do so, and they chose it less when it was more advantageous to choose a certain option. So what this suggests is that D1 receptors in the nucleus accumbens seem to help promote choice of larger uncertain rewards and may help refine and optimize risk-reward decision biases. Although I'm not suggesting you all get a shot of a D1 agonist in your head and go play blackjack right now. That's probably not the best way to go. Knowing that dopamine is important in the brain, next we wanted to see, well, what about dopamine transmission? Do changes in dopamine release in these regions, do they just go up and stay up? Or do, are there dynamic fluctuations in transmission that may relate to changes in the animal's behavior and changes in the information they're processing? So we engaged in a collaborative study using in vivo microdialysis with Tony Phillips at UBC. And so what I'm showing you here is changes in dopamine release within the prefrontal cortex of rats that were playing this game, well-trained rats. And what you can see is that at the start of the session, when reward probabilities were high, dopamine levels were high, and they quickly trailed off. Now, in another group of rats that were trained on the exact same game, but the odds changed in reverse. They started poor, and then they got better over the session. We actually saw a mirror image of this effect. And these two curves were actually statistically indistinguishable when we analyzed them by reward probability. So when we combine these data, we see a curve that looks like this. Dopamine levels are higher when the odds are higher, and lower when they're lower. Now this curve did not really seem to track very well on the animal's behavior. This is how often animals chose the risky option relative to what the dopamine signal in prefrontal cortex was. And their behavior changed at a slower rate than the change in the dopamine signal. What this really did map onto very well though was changes in how much food they were getting over time. And what these triangles are showing you is how many reward pellets they were getting at the same time point mapped onto the dopamine signal. And you can see that the change in the reward rates were statistically indistinguishable in, compared to the change in the dopamine signal in the brain. Now to explore this further, we added a key yoke control group. These were animals that didn't have to press any levers, didn't have to make any decisions. What happened to them was every 40 seconds, they received either one pellet, zero pellets, or four pellets. And their scheduling patterns of rewards were matched identically to another group of rats that actually were playing the game that we did dialysis studies on. So they got the same amount and pattern of food but didn't have to work for their supper. And in that situation, we again saw an identical curve. Dopamine levels were higher when they were getting more food and then they were lower when they were getting less food. So what this suggests is that fluctuations in tonic levels of prefrontal dopamine seem to be serving as this sort of reward running rate meter, keeping track of how much actions have been paying off over time. And if you think of what prefrontal cortex does in these situations, keeping track of actions and outcomes to help modify choice biases, it would need some sort of information saying, this is how well we're doing now compared to how well we were doing 10 or 20 minutes ago. It looks like changes in prefrontal dopamine seem to be serving part of that signal. 
In the accumbents, the story was a little bit different. Again, we saw the dopamine levels were higher and then went lower when the odds went from good to bad, and an opposite profile when the odds went from bad to good. When we combine the data, we see a slightly different looking curve than prefrontal cortex. The first thing we notice here is that changes in accumbents dopamine mapped on almost perfectly to changes in the animal's behavior. These white circles again are how often they chose the risky option across the different blocks, and you can see that the slope of the curve is the same as the dopamine curve. Now the other thing I'll bring your attention to is you see this sawtooth pattern here, down and up, down and up. What these oscillations are representing is the amount of dopamine that's floating around. During the force choice portions, when the animals only have one lever and they just have to take what we give them, versus the free choice portions where they actually have to make a choice. And it turns out that when they actually have to choose, their actions may or may not give them reward, there's just a little bit more dopamine in the system than when they just have to press a lever that we give them. Now, in terms of keeping track of reward rates, the change in the dopamine curve didn't really seem to keep track very well of changes in the amount of reward they were seeing over time, not like we saw in prefrontal cortex. But we still ran our yoked control group. And here, we saw a similar but not identical pattern. What these yellow squares are showing you is data from the yoke control groups that received the same amount and pattern of rewards but didn't have to press any levers or do anything to get it. And you'll notice that these two curves start the same and separate at that point there. What's special about that point there is that's a forced first portion of the task where animals have to make a choice where there's some reward uncertainty, where they may not actually get rewarded. And it turns out under these conditions, there tends to be more dopamine in the nucleus accumbens compared to another group of animals that got the same amount of reward but didn't have to make any decisions. So what this suggests is that fluctuations in tonic dopamine in the accumbens, it's, it's really a mixed bag of signals. It's integrating a variety of different types of information, including the relative amount of reward uncertainty, the overt choice behavior of the animal, whether there's a choice to be made, and changes in the rates of reward over time. And so it seems like tonic dopamine in general is kind of giving this longer view of how things have been going and what have I been doing over the last little while. Now sticking with accumbens dopamine for a minute, some of you may be familiar with the idea that dopamine transmission in the striatum can be compartmentalized into different components. And there's this slower acting changes in extrasynaptic or tonic dopamine transmission that we can measure with techniques like microdialysis. But there are also these rapid, spatially and temporally restricted phasic events that are driven by burst firing of dopamine neurons and dips in dopamine neuron firing. Now, that type of signaling can be measured with things like in vivo voltammetry, much rapider time scale. And it turns out there have been a number of groups using that approach to look at changes in phasic dopamine signaling in the accumbens when animals are engaged in different types of cost-benefit decision-making. These are data from Genus Corelli's group. And what happened here was animals were playing a very similar game to what I've described to you, choosing between a larger, certain, or a larger uncertain reward and a smaller certain reward. And one thing they found was that phasic dopamine signaling seem to keep track of decision outcomes. And what I mean by that is when the animals played risky and won, got that large reward, there was a large increase in phasic dopamine. When they chose the small certain option, there was a smaller increase in dopamine. And when they played risky and lost, didn't get that reward, there was actually a dip in dopamine, very similar to what you'd expect from basic reward prediction error hypotheses. So we were interested in saying, well, are these what are these phasic outcome signals doing? Are they just weird correlative measures, or are they actually somehow contributing to the animal's overt choice behavior? Are they somehow informing the system to do something else on the next try? Now, you can't really get to that question with psychopharmacology, with drugs, antagonists, or what have you, because there you're flooding the entire signal. You're blocking both tonic and phasic signals. So you need a much more temporally and spatially restricted way of manipulating these signals. Well, it turns out, Nature has provided us an endogenous pathway that will allow us to do that. Now, we don't have any fancy lasers up running in the lab quite yet, so this is not an optogenetic experiment, but that pathway that I'm talking about includes a region of the brain called the lateral habenula. Now, if you pick up a copy of Nature Neuroscience or Neuron, you'll see there's something on the lateral. Why do we care about this stupid little nucleus? Well, for one, it seems to exert a very pronounced inhibitory control over dopamine neuron firing. This is just some data from our group. Other groups have shown the same thing. If you stimulate the lateral habenula, you get this marked suppression of dopamine neuron firing that looks very similar to reward prediction errors of dopamine neurons when a monkey doesn't get an expected reward. Now, if you record from lateral habenula neurons, these cells, 
they're kind of like dopamine neurons from the evil parallel universe, right? They're, they're evil Abed dopamine neurons, all right? They fire more, yes, I did make a community reference there. They fire more when something bad happens, like a punishment or a reward omission, and they actually suppress their activity when something good happens. And we now know that the inhibitory control that the habenula exerts over dopamine neurons is mediated by this disynaptic circuit, where we have excitatory projections for the habenula going to a newly discovered brain nucleus called the rostromedial tegmental nucleus, or RMTG. Some people call it the tail of the VTA. And that region, in turn, sends a very dense inhibitory GABA urchid projection onto dopamine neurons. So what we did in another series of experiments is we used discrete electrical stimulation of either the habenula or the VTA itself to modify and overwrite these phasic bursts and dips to kind of ask, well, what information are these outcome-related signals conveying to the animal's choice? So in one experiment, we had animals playing a modified version of our uh, probabilistic discounting task. And what would happen on some trials is they'd pick the risky option and they would not get a reward. They'd lose. Okay, this happens sometime. Now what we know is going on in the rat's head at this point is that's going to cause a phasic dip in activity, a brief suppression in dopamine neuron firing. So what we did in one experiment, only on these trials, is when they lost, we would give a brief 200 millisecond blitz to the VTA. And the idea here is that we would flip that phasic dip into a phasic burst, giving a false signal, hey, you actually won even though they actually lost. And as you might expect, what happens is they start playing more risky. They shift their bias. They're acting as if that risky option was paying off more than it actually was. Okay, well, let's, let's flip this around. Sometimes what would happen is the animal would play risky and it would win. It would get that larger reward. Well, what we know is going on in that situation is that causes this burst in dopamine neuron activity, this brief 10 second increase. So what we did on these trials is when they were getting that larger reward, we would give brief stimulations to the lateral habenula. The idea there is now we're going to suppress those phasic bursts and give a false signal to the system. And what happened in this situation? We shifted bias the other way. Now they started choosing less risky, acting as if that risky option was not paying off as much as it normally was. So I'll, I'll be honest with you, we, we were having fun with these experiments at this point. Well, I was, because I wasn't running the rats. But it's kind of like, OK, we can remote control the rats. We can make it go one way, we can make it go other. So OK, let's, let's change this again. How about every time the animal chooses that small certain option, chooses that safe Canadian government bond? Let's stimulate the habenula den, override that phasic burst. So now we've simulated the bond market crashing. What do they do? We shift their bias again. Now they play more risky again, acting as if now they're not getting a reward for that smaller lever. Well, we might as well play a little more risky because this one doesn't seem to be paying off as much. Even though they actually consumed the reward, tasted it, and what have you, it didn't seem to register in terms of updating their choice behavior. Now, we don't think that these effects are due to some weird aversive response. Maybe they're avoiding the lever because they don't like getting stimulated in the habenula. Because we ran a very simple control experiment where animals chose between a larger and a smaller reward, both delivered at 100% certainty. Every time they got that large reward, we stimulated the habenula. And we saw no change in their choice bias. So it's not as if these are calling animals to just avoid a lever that gives them stimulation. And it's not as if these phasic bursts are always regulating choice biases. But what it suggests is that in these situations where there's this reward uncertainty, these outcome-related phasic bursts and dips are providing short-term updates about recent actions to maybe push the system, hey, that was good, let's do that again, or no, that wasn't so good, let's try something else. And so this may be working hand-in-hand -hand with the tonic signal, with the tonic signal giving the long-term view, this is how things have been going for the last little while, and these phasic bursts and dips riding on top of it saying, yeah, this is what just happened, maybe we should do something different or the same. Now just to finish up, one last study we wanted to do was, well, electrical stimulation of the head banula was a useful tool for manipulating these phasic events, but it doesn't really tell us what that region is doing. Just because you turn it on, it doesn't really give you that much insight into its normal function. So we wanted to do an inactivation study. See, what happens when we take the habenula out of the circuit? So for those of you who aren't familiar, the habenula is, is a pretty tiny nucleus. There's not a lot of real estate in there. If you're going to do a microinfusion, it's going to be pretty tricky. You've got about a millimeter top to bottom. It's below the hippocampus, above the thalamus. So I told my graduate student, Colin Stopper, I said, this is going to be a tricky experiment. He's like, no, no, I got this, no problem. All right, fine. So he comes, does a bunch of implants, runs the animals. Stand, there's no effect. And as a PI, what do I say? Check the histology. 
Turns out he had a bunch of beautiful placements in the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus. Okay? So we don't need neurogenesis for decision making. Yay, okay, try again. All right? So he comes back again. Okay, there's still no effect. Okay, now he had a bunch of placements in the lateral vent or in the third ventricle, whisking away our inactivated agate. All right, so try again. Now he does another round. Now he overshoots. He's in the thalamus. No effect. Come on! And at this point, he's getting really demoralized, as I'm sure many in the room have. I'm never going to get a PhD. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's okay, it's okay. We, we totally meant to do this, okay? Th these are the important control experiments for the diffusion. This is all going in the paper. All right, fine. Finally, after a year of trying, he finally amasses enough placements within the anatomically defined regions of the habenula. What do we see? Well, like the simple-minded folk that we are, we thought, well, if the habenula is telling you what's bad in the environment, if you shut it down, they won't notice bad things are happening like they're losing, and they'll keep going risky. We saw something a lot more crazy. We completely abolished any decision bias they had. They went from choosing more rationally to being completely random in their behavior, choosing 50-50, as if they couldn't figure out which option was better for them. It didn't matter if the odds went from good to bad or bad to good. We actually did a number of other experiments looking other types of cost-benefit decision-making saw this same basic effect. And whenever you see an effect this profound, well, okay, well, maybe they're just blind, or they just can't tell the difference between their left paw and their right paw. No, we don't think that's the case, because when we go to our simple control task, big reward, small reward, all thing, everything else is equal, and we inactivate the habenula, there's no effect. So these simple decisions, just big versus small, that doesn't need this complex circuitry. But as soon as these costs like uncertainty come invo become involved, the habenula seems to be this critical node within this entire circuit that helps an animal express a subjective decision bias. All these other cortical, subcortical circuitries, they're doing computations, this might be better, that might be better, but the habenula seems to be this link pin within the circuit that allows the animal to show a bias one way or the other. So to kind of just summarize six years of our lives, what I've hoped to convince you is that one circuit, when we're engaging in kind of risk-reward decision-making, you have some circuits providing some information going after these large rewards. And these urges are tempered by cortical regions that are keeping track of other factors going on, the longer view. Dopamine in these regions seem to be playing a key role and maybe doing different types of things with D1 receptors, helping the animal overcome losses and maintain risky choices after large rewards, and D2 receptors in prefrontal cortex helping an animal adjust their behavior when things change. Now, within this framework, we have different modes of dopamine signaling. Tonic dopamine seems to be keeping a longer record of rates of return, and these phasic signals seem to be giving moment-by-moment -moment updates of what just happened. And within this entire framework, the habenula seems to kind of be a binding nucleus that allows all these other circuits engaging their computations to express a bias one way or the other. And so what I really hope to convince you today is that if we want to understand complex behaviors like decision making, we have to strip them down into their component parts and realize that we have different regions, each bringing their own bit to the puzzle. And they're working in concert to help guide your behavior in one direction or the other. And with that, I would like to thank the people who collected the data, talented graduate students, collaborators, the people who give us money. You guys have been a great crowd. My name is Stan Floresco, and I'm here all week. Peace. <clears throat>